I think, kind of reading your biography and knowing a little bit about you, my hypothesis is you are an example of all of this. You're a scaled person. You scaled yourself. You got a PhD at Rice University and you worked on the compiler there. And then uh, at, at Sun you scaled the Java compiler, all right? And by scaling the compiler, you scaled Java. And Java became a scaled language, which took over the world and scaled Sun as a company in the process. And then you were at multiple other companies and you applied this technique, all right? You put the uh, compiler technologies into the era of big data and AI. That's kind of my, my proposal, how I see this, how you scale yourself, you scale core piece of technology, which scale the programming language, which scale a whole bunch of other things. And then you took this, and, and most recently you scale other people because you teach, right? And you, so you taught the workshop at Scale by the Bay, which is our conference, and you taught, I think, several dozen people, which spent the whole day following you into the depths of compiler with enthusiasm I've not seen in people doing this. Uh, so uh, so I would say, uh, I think you're very well qualified to kind of inquire on the question of scaling, but maybe first you tell, you can tell a little bit of your own story in your own words, and maybe we can pick up on the kind of questions uh, of scale. Well, gosh, with that intro, I hardly know where to go. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still not quite certain I know what scale means, but it's fine. Um, yeah, so, so you know, a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, right? So how far back do you want to go? Um, very young kid, very nerdy, very insecure, very introspection, introspective, um, introverted. I uh, kind of fell into computers sort of accidentally. They were the new thing floating around the block, and my parents were helping their kids, you know, as parents always do. And I sort of kind of figured them out at a very early age and, and sort of never looked back. Like it was, a, it was an obvious good fit, and I, and I rolled with it all my life. Um, at age, say, eight, I got a Bell Labs bug computer. If you ever go look at it, it's cardboard. Mm -hmm. We're teaching computers for the very, very young. Um, by age 12, I was uh, I passed I passed that grade with straight A's, and I was judged too too immature and too small to go to high school. Mm -hmm. Although I had passed the eighth grade with straight A's, so I retook the eighth grade. Every teacher knew me, knew I knew the stuff, didn't know what to do with me. So my math teacher gave me a book on Fortune Four. I read about Fortune Four when I was 12. That summer, I went to the local university with my mom as a you know son of staff. I had access. The guys in the mainframe room thought it was funny and dumb, so they let me hack Fortran on uh, on a mainframe on a Xerox mainframe. Um, by 15, I had a Radio Shack Trash 80. I got the Byte Magazine article on the Pascal compiler. I thought this is a cool thing. I'll go implement this. So I wrote a compiler when I was 15. Um, these days, that's a grad student course. And it was just a natural fit. It wasn't anyone telling me. It was all self-taught. It was just the right thing for me to do at that time. And sort of that theme just carried on. Um, by my, my early college years, uh, I had taken the fourth programming language, made a version which generated machine code directly, and also, and fourth is a like Java in a sense, it has a JIT built into it, basically. Mm -hmm. Is a stack-based language? Stack-based yes. language, but untyped. So think uh, Python with no types, but you have a REPL. The language is a little odd for a stack, but once you get your head wrapped around it, it looks out fine. They, they can be made extremely tiny back in the day. Um, well, it will run on kilobytes well. Mm -hmm. um, the calculators, yeah, which were right. stacked, uh, yeah. based, right? Yeah. So yeah. And, the, and the, the boot ROMs for Sun computers and many, many, many machines, the starting boot ROMs, because in a few kilobytes you can have a programming language that let you peek and poke all the device drivers and get those all set up before you boot whatever the main OS is. Mm. So BIOSes have been frequently written in, in Fortran. Interesting. Whatever, as it goes. I, I put an IDE around it. I put a, a, a better JIT in it. I did a bunch of things to it, made a different language. That language is still in use as of a few years ago by a handful of people in different parts of the country. So there is a you know 30 plus years long direct use of stuff I wrote. Um, going through college, I you know went from code generation as a hack to formal theory on code generation. Turns into compiler work. Um, got my PhD from Rice. Did a bunch of compilers along the way. 
uh, got pulled into Sun to go make Java Go Fast mm -hmm. because I had written a fast compiler. And I tried to get a PhD in fast compilation and couldn't get it. My advisor would know. So my PhD is in a fun piece of math, and the appendix is all about how to make a JIT go fast. Interesting. Um, and the fun piece of math was another one of these things where somebody said, you can't do that, so I did it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there were several of these things going on. Uh, coming out of that and you know, looking around for a job, um, you know, I was talking to people about redoing comp compilers with this funny sea of nodes things I had done at grad school. And in all of these things, sort of the common theme is there's no compromise on my belief of what I could do and you know how things would work. So I'm a very intuitive coder. I understand things at sort of a root level that I don't see in a lot of other folks. And that lets me know at a glance what something will work or not or how to solve a problem. Um, but in exchange, it's taking me a very long time to learn how to put these things into words well. Mm -hmm. So I could tell you instantly that what you're doing was wrong and I could show you by coding it or write or here's how to solve or whatever. But saying it gracefully was a learning of a lifetime. Mm -hmm. It's part of the introvert learnings. Um, the, the part of the no compromise bit was knowing that it could work, but the systems are large and complicated and getting it to actually do work was the joy and the difficulty. So always the fundamentals were correct, but always the devils in the details. In the case of big ass, hairy, optimized compiler, there's a lot of details going on. So the compiler had a lot of details, took a long time to get right, but when it did, other people had trouble getting it right. Mm -hmm. And so Hotspot eventually won, although it was no means the obvious winner going into it. Hand in hand with that came the learning about uh, parallel and distributed computing and memory models and race conditions for which I don't know if I'm considered a world expert. You talk to different people, they'll say, yeah, you're an expert. Um, I definitely have done a bunch of things there that other people have never done or didn't believe could be done. Um, hand in hand with that came the ability to have Hotspot run parallel compilation with parallel cross loading and parallel execution, parallel television, da 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 da, and get all the bugs out mm -hmm. and have it work well and reliably. And that's part of the scaling of the Java language was, mm -hmm. you know, the world became multi-core when Intel couldn't figure out how to make a faster chip. Mm -hmm. So we got more. What to do with them? So I figured something out to do with it in terms of the core guts of Java. From there, um, I don't know, lots of different things. Um, I went and hacked custom hardware. Um, I don't do hardware, but I talked to hardware guys directly. CPU designer at Azul sat next to me. Mm -hmm. And we went back and forth on what makes a good uh, Java JIT target. Um, that was another very much a fun exploratory learning thing. Very much uh, a high scale, highly parallel, you know, thousand, roughly thousand cores. Um, very looser memory model. So again, all about memory models and parallel distributed thinking. Uh, pivoted over to H2O, which was doing, uh, is doing, uh, machine learning at scale. Mm -hmm. So from parallel to distributed, which is even a more difficult version of the same thing, but also picked up this huge pile of math. So I will no means claim I'm a math expert, but because I'm a parallel computing expert, I built a platform there that is a decade later still being sold and used widely. Um, that does high-speed math faster than the obvious competitor Spark uh, mm -hmm. by like 10x. I, mean, I don't know if the numbers are currently 10x, but last time I checked, they were still something close to 10x faster for standard, ordinary differential equation, uh, Gauss-Newton solvers, general linear modeling, I don't know what the hell, all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of watched the rise of uh, GPUs for doing neural nets and uh, helped diagnose and design, but I didn't implement those algorithms on H2O, but figured out how to do, uh, sort of in a high theoretical way, a parallel version of neural nets. And uh, Arno Kandel is a really great guy, did all the implementation details there, and I, I can't sort of praise him enough. I threw in my two bits and said, this works, and mm -hmm. he did all the work. So I shouldn't, I shouldn't claim credit there. <laughs> yes, but I remember that, you know, you, uh, as the CTO, yeah. Uh, you, st you, 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 you give talks. 
Yeah. And what, what really was great for me, because one of the mantras we have in the community is that it's easier for software engineer to become machine learning uh, scientist than for machine learning scientist to become a software engineer, because uh -huh. all this yeah. complexity, yeah. right, all these yeah. distributed systems, it takes decades to get right, I think, at this, yes. at this point. And so, so I think you kind of proved this by standing up and, and talking about the AI for, for the software engineers. And our audience is mostly software engineers yeah. whose job is on the line to deliver everything their founders promised in terms of AI. Yeah. And, and, and here's the performance questions, and here's the implementation questions, right? And yeah. so it's one thing to do it in a notebook, and another thing to do it in a distributed system. So I think that was really kind of what was great about H2O is that you guys basically were very hands-on. And, and you went in and you taught a bunch of software engineers and it's still going very strongly with yep. the meetups, right? That basically yep. I think most of the folks who go there are software engineers. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So so at H12 I kind of started scaling the other side, another, another aspect of me. Um, so there was obviously the tech and distributed, which super fast key value store, that was cool. Distributed parallel machine learning, very cool. Paralyzed some algorithms that no one said you could parallel. People had said you cannot paralyze. Um, that was cool, but I also started working on my people skills and uh, and trying to figure out how to lead an engineering team in the sort of the most productive way. Um, so both teaching people how to do it, but making an environment that was safe for everybody, mm -hmm. that was making it uh, uh, palatable to be there, to go to work every day, mm -hmm. to, to, to uh, you know, show your best. Yes. Um, since then, I've been at a number of other companies where I have kept uh, exercising that half, still doing coding, still doing distributed scaling computing, still doing these things, but also teaching people aspects, as well as learning them sort of on a continuous basis. And for the past two, two and a half years now, I have keynoted a couple times a year on self-awareness for introverts, mm -hmm. which specifically targeting programmers, you know, why programmers stuck at salary negotiations is the, the, the byline on that one. Um, and that's just uh, uh, you know, me turning my engineering head toward people and emotions, um, you know, sort of in a way that uh, uh, it's different from how extroverts view the world and think about things. And this just comes about because, you know, being an introvert, I let myself get run over by a lot of folks during my career. Mm -hmm. so, so I made some really cool tech, and I didn't personally benefit from it other than, uh, you know, fame, but not fortune. Um, and by the way, if you get a chance to have either, but not both, a fortune's a hell of a lot more fun. <laughs> <laughs> Frame helps. It, 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 frame helps. Fortune's a lot more fun. Um, <laughs> you know, money won't make you happy, but you can live very comfortably, sadly, with money. <laughs> it can give you a runway to learn to be happy. Um, there's a different things you have to do to learn to be happy, <laughs> and you can be happy without money. It's true, but like I said, it makes life a whole lot more comfortable. Specifically, if you're raising a family, having money helps. Mm -hmm. You can raise a very happy family without any money, but having money helps. And it gives you an insurance plan should, you know, crap hit the fan kind of thing. True, well, that's where, where we live, right? Yes, yes. Well, in Silicon Valley, you pretty much have to have some money uh, to, to make it work. All right, fine. So, so there's been a lot of self-awareness for myself learning mm -hmm. going on, um, and then bringing it from my, my core gut and my intuition and then and from my heart to my head, and then from my head I can get it into words. And from words I can turn it into slides and presentations and teaching. And I, I've done this sort of, I started doing this on small groups, individuals, small groups, larger groups. Um, strong resonation uh, with the crowd at the J.Cree, which then turned into people who run conferences go to J.Cree, and they said, come give this as a keynote. Gave it as a keynote, person there saw to come give it as a keynote here, and that has been daisy chaining along the last several years. So there's a lot of aspects, and I guess this goes to where I'm being scaled. I, I, I am still a world expert on compilers, but also distributed in parallel computing, memory models and memory ordering is part of that. I am 
an expert at machine learning implementation. Mm -hmm. I won't claim new algorithms per se, but I can take an old algorithm and make it do new tricks. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, for instance, why random forest cannot be run distributed the obvious way where you run a build a tree on every slice on every different node. It doesn't work mathematically, mm -hmm. maybe not for this talk, but there's but I know that. And that just goes to say I, I have a competence in, in ML that's pretty deep. Um, go to Norensic and I'm looking for fraud in the stock market. And again it's distributed and scale scaled computing because I'm looking at a billion transactions a day kind of thing and a lot of machine learning. And so I have a decent data science aspect to me as well. And then there are a lot of people skills um, that I kept refining uh, from Norensic, from H2O, from Norensic and afterwards that turned into, um, I can give a talk on introverts and people will totally resonate and I'll get mobbed afterwards and people will talk to me and this kind of a scene will happen for Days and months afterwards, I will get one-off individuals, hey, I was there at this talk you gave, it really changed my life. There is something there. There's a, there's a wake up for a large collection of the programming population um, that I think I can, I, I can approach. You know, I can teach, talk it to you in a way that you understand. Yes. You know, this is interesting to me. I want to pick up on a few themes which you mentioned. Uh, so the, you know, one of the topics I want to really explore is how good engineering scales companies and I think being an engineer you know right that really truly scaled companies which we respect such as Google Amazon Microsoft Facebook you may love or hate them but you know that they have great open source they have great engineers right and, and companies which were primarily run as businesses such as Yahoo as an entertainment executive set failed and so my as an engineer I, I love the idea that companies rise and fall ultimately on the base of technology to have enough chance right and so what you said is very interesting because so let me interrupt for a second yeah let me claim that you need both sides in equally good portions yes because sun had tech but the management team was not an a rank player mm -hmm. there were some good people and some less good people and that ultimately failed as well yes so um to run a technology company, it requires both. Jeff Bezos is a is the best of the best for CEO. Yes. Right. So he may not have the technology skills that I do, but there's no question about his business acumen. Yes. That's a crucial piece of it. Part of that is he helps make the engineering palatable and useful and fun, and so you can get top-notch engineering, which you also have to add, have as you pointed out for the Yahoo example, lack of that turns into you get overrun by better technology down the road at some point. So you need both. Right. In, but in, in at Yahoo, I have a lot of friends who were at Yahoo and are like it's in different incarnations and, 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 and pieces. And, and so they, they were great engineers. So what one of the topics I actually want to explore, I don't want to say that technology uh, uh, is superior to executive because we know that ultimately these are the executives who, you know, who sell companies, who buy companies, who pay people money. So, I mean, th there is no question that the CEO overrules the CTO. The question is, uh, I think a lot of books which talk about uh, the history of Google, Microsoft, and Amazon, they're written by MBAs and business journalists, and they do not look in the technology. And I think that, that one of the problems I want to overcome with this is to get deep insight into, basically, it's, my premise is very simple. You cannot have a scale technology company without a great technology. It may seem trivial, but the, the point of technology being great and important and the way it runs is very often superseded by business stories. Right, and so what, what's really interesting to me is uh, what is the, like, how a company, uh, a scaled company, uh, and its executives should properly scale their best technology. What is the, the good examples, which is the right relationship, and obviously the technology is very complex. It's very easy to just like move little post-its and, and to keep track time. Like, yeah, yeah let, me, let, me, let me step in here. Um, in all of the cases that I've seen work well here, there is a core idea and a core champion. Mm -hmm. The champion makes the idea, and the idea is a technology that can change the world, and the champion understands that it's changing the world. Maybe he doesn't understand why or how directly, but he understands that it is. Mm -hmm. The business person doesn't understand the tech, but they see how the technology changes the world, and that's the reason they're 
promoting and pushing it, and they let the champion be a champion of the technology, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. they, 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 it's the golden goose, and you need to have them in the golden hen house? Whatever you, I don't know what the right analogy is, but he has to be in a safe place, mm -hmm. and then he can run with the tech. With that comes this ideology of this, this cool, awesome tech that's changing the world that resonates so strongly with other engineers everywhere. Mm -hmm. And they want to pile in and say, hey, I want to help do this thing. Mm -hmm. I want to make H2O scale, I want to make Scala scale, I want to make Spark scale, whatever. There's a cool tech here and we're making it happen. We're trying to save the world. We see how it is saving the world. Mm -hmm. um, the actual dotting the lines between saving the world and making money is not their problem, not the engineering problem. They're mm -hmm. letting that piece be handled by somebody else. Mm -hmm. They focus on the tech and they, they get pumped and they, they carry and run. While that goes, um, you know, you can build. Right? You can build a, a scaled company up to the point where the technology is or is not saving the world anymore. Yes, yes. But obviously uh, you need to recognize that the management should recognize this is happening. And there is also this stereotype that the nerds are difficult, right? So because they don't see the business side, right? And so like you've been in leadership positions, right? Yeah, so yeah, so yeah. I, I'm wondering, right, when you run teams, yeah. maybe we can talk yeah. a little bit and maybe in yeah. general, yeah. like would, would you see some young guy coming up yeah. who is difficult yeah. and maybe you would yeah. recognize some yeah. Yeah, what yeah, of yeah, yourself yeah, yeah, in this guy, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, and and like right. he 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 does not see yet the implications of the business. Sometimes you need to cut corners to ship, right? And stuff like this. Usually, difficult comes with personnel issues. Not the business. Not that they can't see the business. Mm -hmm. They can't see the personal impact mm -hmm. of their behavior on people around them. If they can see their personal behavior, the business of the people around them. Usually they can understand the business implications. They mm -hmm. have a broader view of the world. Mm -hmm. They understand business implications and you have to explain to them the various cost benefit trade-offs. Always when you're running these companies, there is, and I, I have to say just, I stopped at a, you know, 50 person is the largest company I was part of that I personally had a leadership role. So at this size companies, there's always a lot of risk involved. There's a lot of trade-offs. You don't clearly see the path to the, the business success. So you're trying to walk the best probable solution with lots and lots of paths in front of you that continuously fork. Mm -hmm. And as things happen, you, you make a decision and you change direction. You make a decision, you change direction constantly. Uh, and that, by the way, is part of being a, a scalable person is I handle change very well. Mm -hmm. um, didn't used to be that way. One of the things I bring to the table is I can explain to engineers how that, that change is coming, how to handle that change, the change was not bad, and what the impacts it means for them to be able to change. So a key thing of that is they get passionate, they pour their heart and soul into something, they build a thing, and while they're building it, the business changes. Mm -hmm. You have to pivot. You have to explain to this person that the thing they've poured their money, their, 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 their soul energy into their love was good at that time, mm -hmm. it's no longer good. This is no reflection on them as a person. They are not bad, the thing they built was not bad, it just doesn't fit the current needs, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And you have to step them through the loss. They're gonna go through a grieving process. I'm gonna give up my baby. Mm -hmm. So you have to help them understand that, that they're gonna give up their baby, they're not bad, the baby wasn't bad, we couldn't see, if we could have seen, we never would have steered you this path. Mm -hmm. Now things are different, we like you to please step over and aim a different direction. If there's something you can pull out of your baby and take it to the new place, that's great. Mm -hmm. But if not, you know, let it go. I understand this is painful for you, I understand that you're gonna go through some grieving process. Um, you know, go have a beer, commemorate with your buddies, and say, shit, you know, shit hit the fan, yeah. and done and then come back tomorrow and let's talk about where we're headed not where we were headed so then the, when like a big project folks worked on for a long time changes does open source help this mitigate a little bit um so open source um as a as a as a production of a tool or as a consumption so as a consumption it's it's an interesting problem because you pick up somebody else's bugs and you pick up somebody else's forward progress at the same time. Mm -hmm. If you're 
in bed deep with a particular tool, it's very useful. Mm -hmm. If you're producing open source, then the, the question becomes, I'm pivoting away from this, who cares? Yes. And if it's open and somebody cares, they can pick it up and run with it so that you can feel maybe less bad that it didn't turn into what you wanted. Um, maybe they can take up the slack on it enough that you'll keep this other thing around mm -hmm. um, because it doesn't cost you anything to maintain an extra off-side thing that's not your core focus. Mm -hmm. um, and I see companies do this a lot where they, they spin off a tech that they're no longer part of their core business focus mm -hmm. and there's a community that's been loving it and they pick it up and run with it. And some of that core tech just, you know, languishes forgotten on GitHub. Yes. Yeah, it happens. Yeah, so I think Apple has GCC with its all its additions open source somewhere. You yes. can find it yes, somewhere. Fine. You yeah. can build it if you want to. Yes, right, exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, because yeah, they yeah, have yeah. To. Uh, but I'm but I'm thinking that, you know, uh, open source was one of the best things for engineers because their work is not locked in. So if somebody let's say does not agree ah, with you. Okay, fine. Yeah, so this was a, this was a big piece of learning for me and, and I, let me let me go down the store here. Um, yeah, I did some awesome tech at Azul. It got locked behind the paywall at Azul. A lot of it was never brought forth um, out. We tried at some point, but it was too difficult to bring it out and about um, into the mainstream uh, Oracle JVM, mm -hmm. even as I was you know, starting from Hotspot, the same code base, and doing obviously you know, things that a decade later Oracle's now attempting to do ZGC. Azul's been there 10 years ago, like mm -hmm. what the hell? Fine. So, so one of the learnings for me was, uh, if a company pays for something, that's theirs, fine. But if I'm going to do a thing that I think is cool and neat, and maybe it helps my company, I'm going to very carefully delineate when it's open source and when it's funded by the company, mm -hmm. and never again let it get parked behind a paywall. Mm -hmm. um, high scale lib and you know mostly non-blocking hash map is that that thing. I mm -hmm. had definite pushback at Azul Systems, and I said, no sir, I am doing this on my own time. You do not get to claim it as Azul property, this is mine. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I left Azul, I still had, you know, not fucking hash map. And so I've been careful with that mindset going forward. Mm -hmm. At H2O, I pushed for it to be open source. Uh, we went back and forth, actually, between Apache V2 and closed and, and a more broader open source. Um, but I wanted it open source so that should I leave H2O, and eventually I did, um, you know, I, I walked away with the H2O of the tech. Yep. And then I used it at Marenza. And I used it in, you know, personal projects internally for a, 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 a number of times. So would you advocate for kind of dual development from the start? When you start a company, you basically say, if, if you're in the space where you expect developer adoption, would you say that it's uh, useful to start, if, if it's a tooling company of any kind, if right? You want, if you want developer adoption, you almost guaranteed have to have an open source piece to it. Because for developers to buy into your tech and depend their lives on your tech, they have to sort of get in bed deep with it. They have to understand, live your bugs, fix your bugs, tweak your stuff to fix their problem space, because it's never a straight hit. Mm -hmm. um, this goes straight to, straight to a different thing I have about, you know, when do I pick up third-party libs, right? Right. I pick them up very carefully because it's almost always cheaper counting the learning time, the bug fix time of the other person's stuff, the, the unknown whatever they pulled in and pulled in and pulled in versus a targeted, narrow, custom fit solution. Um, it, it sounds good to just grab and run. Um, in my experience, this never pays, not never, it rarely pays out except for where you have very narrowly targeted libraries that are very well debugged. So mm -hmm. typically old, been around the block, have a narrow focus in life, I pick those up. Mm -hmm. Broad spectrum things, I pick up extremely carefully. Um, which was part of the problem with selling H2O, it's a broad spectrum tool, if you're mm -hmm. solving your problems with it, you pick those up carefully because that hasn't been around 20 years, right? Yes. And, 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 and therefore, you kind of had to be open source to get adoption at all. You know, Databricks and Spark went the same route. Yes, and they, I mean, I witnessed firsthand what you mentioned, how engineers got excited 
right? Yeah. Like there was yeah. a point in time Hadoop was slow and clunky, yeah, and, right. uh, and you know, like it was not strongly typed because you dump stuff to disk and read it back, right? right? And now yeah. you have Spark where the cluster is a personal computer, and yeah. you feel like program basic again, except the whole memory. And so, and people got excited because you know you think of something like that map is there, that filter is there, right? Yeah. Basically, you yeah. think of a method what it should be called. Right. And it was right there, right? And so I think it's hit, really hit the nerve. Uh, yeah. And I think, yeah. I don't know how often, how often do you think this kind of happens when the, what the, I call developer champions pick up the technology and then they tell it their bosses? To Spark. Yes. It definitely, it happened to H2R. Is it, is it something which is, would, would you say like, this should be the way to work with engineers or is it, is it a fluke? Like, the, 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 you, you go look at any of these sort of you know, engineering, software engineering team, whatever, how to, how to do it. And there's a whole lot of people will say, you know, there's a champion model. Mm -hmm. There is a champion. Um, I think that model really works. And by the way, it's cold, and yes. I'm going to put my extra jacket on. Absolutely. Yeah, so the, the reason the champion model works is because there's too many disparate pieces floating around, and the technology is complicated. Always you're working at the edge of what people, humans can hold for complexity in their head. So somebody has to bring forward the unifying theme and, uh, and play what I call the damn it man role. When the ties are there, you can't really tell one tech from another, damn it, do it this way. Mm -hmm. And it has to be somebody that people admire enough that they'll buy into it and go. Mm -hmm. um, once you have that model in place, then technical fights between engineers are resolved by going to the champion yep. who says, damn it, do it this way. Yep. And it helps if he acknowledges, yes, both sides have merit. Yes, I can imagine doing it both ways. I don't have an obvious winning solution. Um, but we need to pick one and focus. So marching orders, I've taken your advice. Here are your marching orders. Please go march this way. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and you need to acknowledge that the other side has merit. This, this gets into you know, self-awareness for introverts. And the, the problematic young engineer is, not have them not being able to see other sides well or not being able to gracefully state I don't believe your position maybe because they are at a loss words how to explain why they see that it has an issue mm -hmm. it's fine um, it does mean that the 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 more senior people still need to have a trusted person that is the champion that's this is how the project's going to go yes yes yeah. and and I think this is it is great, like let's say you're an advisor or you're actively involved, yeah. you can be this tiebreaker. It's yeah. easy. Yeah. You know, the startup will be fortunate, but if it's there are guys of about equal seniority and one wants to use this and the other wants to use that, that can lead yeah. to, so right. to Right, so to this conflict. is personal conflicts, right, yeah. and now it depends on how well people work it out. And there are a couple models I've seen happen here. Um, I've seen uh, a, a manager who's clearly not a technical expert break mm -hmm. the tie. Yes. Because he didn't know better, but he knew the fight was no good. Yes. Okay. What then happens is that the losing guy can get pissed. Exactly. And walk off. Because it was not done for merit, but for political reasons, to uh -huh. keep things tight and quiet. Uh -huh. Yes, to get things quiet. Because productivity comes for engineers especially when everyone's basically quiet. They can't handle the show of emotions well. Yes. So you need to have a non-emotionally, vi not violent, but too active a, an environment. Right. People want to be happy. Yes. Okay, fine. Not, the engineers in general don't necessarily do that well, express their own happiness or sadness or handle their emotions. Things build until they pop. The pop is ugly. Fine, it happens. Okay. So the manager is reasonably saying, I have to break the tie to get calm, but that means he's going to lose a senior engineer who's pissed and right. doesn't necessarily want to go. He probably has less people skills than the winning guy because the winning guy got more political support. Maybe. Maybe. No, no, no. no not I've necessarily. seen it go both ways. I've seen it yeah. both going ways. The real issue, though, is how do you not lose a guy when you're the manager in this position? Mm -hmm. Right? How do you not piss off one of the guys? You need to find a champion that both of these guys admire. Mm -hmm. One of them may become the champion. The loser may wander off, the remaining guy may become the champion if he picks up even a modicum of people skills, mm -hmm. but his solution also then works. People around like trust, hey, we didn't know how to handle X, we went this way, that was Joe's solution, it worked, Joe has something going. Maybe it's potluck, you know, maybe it's, you know, next time it doesn't work. We get a couple of those under your belt, Joe's the champion. Yes. 
not necessarily the best way to get there. Hopefully it works. But Right, <laughs> but you're there now. Yes. Um, and that's sort of, you know, that's a way to understand the manager's side of how he picks and why he had to pick. You'd rather have that champion come from the get-go. Usually it's grown internally. Usually somebody just stands up and says, no, 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 blah, 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 blah. And, and, and they have something sharp and, and they're, they're ready to go and they're running with it. And as they run with it, other people are like, oh yeah, that's our cool idea. And they pile in. Now you have the champion the honest way, grew internally, and there's no conflict of interest and it's all good. Mm -hmm. I want to kind of link the, back, going back to history, right? Yeah, so, yeah. so can you kind of uh, think how this applies? Uh, so I'm very curious, right? Java really took over the world, and you had really your fingers on its pulse and its success, but you were not, like you said, you were brought into Sun to help the scaling problem, yeah, right. right? And so, how can you talk a little bit about this? How did they realize they have a scaling problem? Uh, how did they find you? How did you get into a position where you can actually enact actual change and something which really won right. over? Yeah, 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 okay. So, um, Urs Hutzel, who was very early at Google um, and is still a very senior person at Google, uh, grabbed me because I want to say he saw one of my very early PhD talks, but I don't know, but he saw my appendix as how to do a compiler fast. Mm -hmm. And what he saw at Sun was Java the language needed a better compiler. And what really had happened was Java was Sun's attempt at making a write once run anywhere language so they could keep in the hardware business against Intel and Microsoft, which mm -hmm. that combo was winning the world. And they're like, no, no, we have to not die to this. I want to sell spark chips and Solaris, not Intel and Microsoft. Okay, fine. So let's get people an alternative language where you wrote it, it works, but it'll work on us too. Fine. That was not running fast. Um, they gra Sun grabbed uh, uh, um, the self-project folks David, I don't, I'm gonna get the wrong, uh, no, no, Craig Chambers, Craig Chambers. Mm -hmm. um, they, they grabbed the, the, the self folks which were running a startup called Anamorphic um, that was attempting to combine on the fly JIT compilation and uh, uh, the nice self environment which was this very cool, fun, gooey, and a nice programming language. So they said, pivot over to Java. Um, they started doing that. Their team was a bunch of grad students who were sharp guys now, very senior. Um, but at that time, they didn't have any real solid compiler skills. They had code generation, like I did when I was a teenager, my very early college years, they could issue code and make it run, but they didn't have formal compiler skills for doing high quality code generation. As a consequence, the code quality sucked. It was better than an interpreter, it was slow. Or it says, this guy knows his com compiler tech inside and out, um, let's pull him in. And he pulled me in and said, go make Java go fast. Mm -hmm. In parallel, so this is, so to me, I, I didn't, I came in at a stage, there was a Java thing running around, but the, the, the golden trinary hadn't, hadn't built yet. That was Josh Block doing the, the libs, mm -hmm. and Doug Lee doing the memory model, and me doing the jet. Mm -hmm. And I'll claim it was the, the, the perfect storm of those three events that made Java, like, you know, take off. Well, Collapse of frequency scaling meant parallel, which meant memory model and parallel code generate, uh, not code generation, parallel programming model, mm -hmm. which Java had and C did not. Mm -hmm. Right, okay, jitting meant that you, you had this run anywhere thing and you got rid of one of your issues about how you made a binary and had to ship and deliver it and distribute jar files. Yes. Way how more convenient. <clears throat> and then the libraries were like fantastic. So there was this perfect trinary. I became one without realizing it. I had no clue that that was what was going on. Until, until I had Hotspot, like 1.3, it was a, you know, the, the compiler was working for about a year, it was pretty buggy, but when it worked, it worked pretty well, um, bailed out a lot of things, but you're clearly getting this 10X or not, and 10X or not kind of thing was going on. You, most of the time you had a 10X and you fell in a pothole and it didn't compile, <laughs> da, 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 da. People were all trying to work out the bugs and how to dodge the potholes, but it was all a work in progress. And I went to Java 1 to give a talk. Mm -hmm. And it had been a while since I'd done a talk, but I knew I could do public talks because I'd done a bunch for my PhD presentation. I'd done a bunch at Sun where I told you, you can't JIT code on the fly. No compiler can do this. And I was like, yes, I can. Of course, I, this is the no compromise clip. Of course, I can do this. <laughs> um, I gave a talk. I was just like two, either in 1999 or 2000, Java 1. And I went to go stand up on stage 
and I literally couldn't get into the room because the mob of people trying to get into the room exceeded the capacity by more than double. <laughs> Um, and so I was like pushing my way through the crowd and people were like, hey, hey, go wait in line. You know, you can't get in the room. <laughs> like, I'm the speaker. <laughs> so, you know, and that's the point I realized that something had changed in Java's acceptance in the world. Like people were really in love with it and they wanted it to go fast. Mm -hmm. So I gave that talk, Sun basically rescheduled the following talk, emptied the room, forced everyone out, then let the next set of people in. They filled it over capacity, like the fire marshal came in and stopped it at 400 people in a 350 person room. They had another 400 people in a 350 person room. And then the end of the week, I gave it a third time at a, a hundred, 150 is what I was thinking I'd show up at. Mm -hmm. and, and, then, and then we had a Q and A afterwards. Like I couldn't, couldn't even do Q and A in these other talks because they just like shove everyone back out so the next crowd could get in. <laughs> uh, fine. So that's when I knew that something had happened and I didn't quite get it yet, but it was important. So I got my own self goodness out of this. You know, my ego was massively stroked. Here, I am pumped and I'm gonna make this thing go. So, you know, I doubled down. I blew off Google. I would have been employee number 50 because or said, hey, come over for Google. You're uh -huh, a sharp uh -huh. guy. And, <laughs> well, I'll see how that worked out. That was the fame versus fortune decision that I had, you know, internet search. Who's gonna pay for internet search? So <laughs> lost that one. Um, yeah. Uh, Google, world's a different Google place. is still around, so it's not... Nice. Yeah, <laughs> and I've poked my nose over there several times and kind of didn't find the right fit. Like, the, 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 the groups doing languages didn't want me in. That was kind of a funny deal because I think I would have displaced whoever was the champion, and the mm -hmm. champion didn't want that. Yeah. I get it, but it kind of sucked. So then I'm like, oh, I can go run some sort of ML side team or whatever. I've been doing TensorFlow. Maybe, you know. They have Chris Ludner now, right? Which is he's a language guy, which is very interesting to me. Okay. You're right, and so it's the creator of Swift ah. in TensorFlow, and so I think his whole idea, Ooh. which is very exciting, that now that you have Swift bindings for TensorFlow, uh -huh. Swift is obviously better for us uh -huh. than Python, you know, it has types, <laughs> which actually mean uh -huh. stuff, uh -huh. and 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 he can add automatic differentiation to Swift. Yes. Right. They have the Swift improvement process, but obviously, uh, since they're they have a very strong group there, so I'm super excited. And actually, I was going to ask you about it because maybe, maybe uh, unless now, uh, because this this is a very interesting development, which to me is super exciting, right? Because what we've seen with the rise of data science is the right of 12 week bootcamper developer who basically pivoted, and this is great that folks do that, but the folks who come into data science generally. Uh, do not have software engineering experience, as folks would do decades of this, to whom continuous delivery is second nature, and things like that, and suffering because of bugs, right? Like the normal mode of a developer is to be depressed and things are not working, right? <laughs> and and it's, it's not like things are always working and you need to do them more acutely, yes. right? Things yeah. are generally in shambles, and then they work, <laughs> this is the, the good state, right? And so, <laughs> so to me, it's very interesting that so we have this culture of social engineering and data science and, and, uh, and, and flourish the, and data Python. Data science has a different kind of bug, by the way. But, but maybe, I don't know if you want to go through now, you know, stop you mid sentence we can come back to this one. Yeah, and so, so again, this is my theory, which, which, which I see as a software engineer, right? Like, I, I'm a computer science, I have a PhD in computer science, but my favorite algorithm is sort, unique, take top 10. And it's just a question of what you sort on, right? Like, it's really, in the end, it's all that. It's, it's just that, right? And so, and the question is, like, you really need to sort a lot of stuff. And so, so, uh, so this kind of my, my thinking, I, I always look in, you know, like, I ask in the room, who runs web scale system on a notebook, on a Python notebook? Is, is, there, is, there, anybody, is there anybody who runs an a, a real-time API yeah. on a Python notebook, right? So, so that was, that was, that's not, there are two different modes, backend people, hardcore back, yeah. backend people, yeah. and compiler people used to yeah. be the, hardest core of the backend people. And so what we have now, I think, at uh, Swift or TensorFlow project is where compiler people are brought in to bear on the ML. So Eugene Burmaka, who was the language tool at Twitter doing Scala, he moved to uh, TensorFlow uh, team. And what they are working now is 
MLIR, Machine Learning Intermediate Representation. So I think that the immediate goal of that is to basically say, because they meet to GPUs, TPUs, and, and CPUs, it's not really the job of a data scientist to optimize this. So they, right, right. But, but now they get deep into machine learning and they take over uh, and TensorFlow is actually data intensive application on, yeah. built on data flow. So, and so they take that and then now build the intermediate representation to, to optimize it much better than manual, right? And so, so what is very interesting to me, are we at the beginning of the era where we take this fragile vase from the hands of some of the data scientists and put it in in the land where you can reason about uh, code itself from compiler techniques and obviously from my standpoint it leads to safety right uh, like you do it in in, in a type safe uh, verifiable provable mode and obviously you, you cannot entrust your AI data to Python, right? Like this is this is this but just. You obviously can because you've been doing that for twenty years. <laughs> but why would you want to, you know, put the fruit of your hard labor, in the extraction of behavior, customer behavior, financial data, your your deepest secrets into a blob of slow goo, which uh, and and, and is people hard to are doing it for twenty years. Right. So there's an obvious answer. <laughs> which is because this other shit's both brand new and has been shown to fail repeatedly and crashes all the time. It's very complicated to set up and run with. It's not my easy to understand, easy to manage, easy to control Python notebook. Right. Right? Right. So, so <clears throat> there's an obvious answer why. <clears throat> I'm not claiming that there's not a better way, but that there's, there is a passion for all compiler engineers that you can solve all problems with compiler technology. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily true. <laughs> yes. But there's a passion that you can. Yes. And it's also the case, having done enough data science, to recognize that there is a kind of a typing concept that goes with data science where I have a, a pile of data, but I know things about it that I want to carry forward that knowledge into my next steps and the typing of it would be things like it has a different kind of a mean, it has a normal distribution, I have done sort of imputation of outliers or missing values, I have mm -hmm. done a bunch of things to it, it has a certain quality to it. I would love to describe that quality in a, in a way that's understandable by a compiler. Mm -hmm. So when I go to the next step in my, my thing, I don't pull out an algorithm that will utterly fail if I don't have a normal distribution, but I, you know, I know I have a normal distribution already, or I don't know because I'm validating the data and I discover along the way that it has a blend of distributions, I cannot then apply certain kinds of technologies afterwards or the math is wrong and I'll mm -hmm. get you know, garbage in, garbage out. Yes. There's some compiler tech that makes sense around data science. Oh, I have the compiler side of it. I don't have enough data science other than to recognize that I routinely would work through data flows where I knew there were certain properties that it was building on and building and building on and if I missed steps or screwed up or skipped steps or didn't quite have the, the, techno the math properties correct, the following steps are garbage, that didn't break until five steps later, and it's a classic debugging problem, but on data side of things, never a stack trace, never a crash, I just got a number out, but the number mm -hmm. was garbage. Yes. And I had to go backwards, why were you garbage? Well, eventually I discovered this was, oh, you were garbage because you got garbage, and then you rolled it back, and oh, here I injected some sort of, you know, a, a common one in FinTech domains, doing any sort of predictive modeling of markets as you bring in, uh, history that you're building your model from into your current prediction uh, in a cheaty way, and that's you know gives you this awesome prediction which doesn't work tomorrow because you don't have tomorrow's data to make tomorrow's prediction. Yes. yes. But but it's very easy to accidentally do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. So all it just means that there's a there's a obvious crying need for compiler tech and data science. For, I, like so you just, for, for backtesting, it sounds like yes. you can benefit, right? Because oh, no, you can no, design type system. There's a lots of it. Backtesting is an example where you can totally benefit from it. Yeah. Yes. But there are other examples floating around. I, I totally applaud these guys' efforts. Um, but you ask, why would I? Because I've done so for 20, why would I use Python? I've done so for 20 years. And up till now, it's, you know, alternatives have been difficult or garbage. And one of the things that H2O did was we only built sort of top-notch algorithms that were hard verified by mathematicians and data scientists that handled all the corner cases. They did not fail silently and give you crap answer. If they were going to fail, you got the polite, we're dead now, you know, this doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, and that was one of the big changes that, I mean, I don't know where Spark is now, but decade ago that we could 
clearly show the data scientists didn't like to use Spark, that we talked about, didn't like to use Spark because the algorithms were not the sort of top end ones. If they failed, they silently gave you garbage mm -hmm. instead of reporting back correctly that I'm about to give you garbage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because you guys have great uh, statistical advisors, right? Tip Sharani and... We totally, yes. And in-house, we always kept mathematicians on board uh, full-time whose job it was to validate algorithms and paid attention to them. We, we made, the, made the engineers like change algorithms painfully in ways they didn't want to because they weren't doing the math right. You know, the algorithm in theory kind of worked, but if you want to get the math right, you actually have to do the following thing for the following reasons that are not obvious and they were painful. But once you did it, then you would at least get the, you know, the big red flag would come out of the algorithms. It would say something, you know, I failed to converge as opposed to I converged to a garbage number. Right. And I think here, you being a mathematician, the yeah. origin yeah. probably helps, right? Because that's the mathematical mentality. Yeah, I, I you know, I, I, I not had any mathematical training beyond, you know, what it took to get an electrical engineering degree, mm -hmm. um, which I didn't use for 20 years until just now. I mean, just for H2O. And mm -hmm. then, uh, yeah, I spent three years hardcore studying math. So um, what advice would you give to a programmer to scale themselves? So, so every time I write a piece of code, I go backwards, I get it more or less working. I go backwards and look and say, how can I clean this up and tidy it? Mm -hmm. How do I do tech debt elimination on the spot? Um, and with that comes this this notion of doing very local only transformations mm -hmm. with the goal of reducing the code size and, and cleaning up how things are used. Because when you write a piece of code, you don't know where you, how you're going to get there, but you know you can get there. So you're scrambling forward, you're hunting through some jungle of code, you got somewhere. You never go in a straight line, you always wrote some crap, you have some dead code, you have some false starts, you have some left right turns that don't need to be there. You straighten it out, that's detected elimination, fine. Do it even on a very small scale, practice it, because you can get good at it and you can get quick at it. And when you get quick and good at it, the code you write just becomes sharper even moment by moment. And every day I do the, the, the practice thing of all the code I write, I, I try to, what can I do better here? How do I shrink it? How do I express this? And every day I'm looking for what's a new thing I'm going to learn today about the land of coding. And it seems kind of trite, and it's old hat, and I've been practicing it for you know 40 years, um, and it pays off. So yes, it's trite. Yes, you hear this advice before. Yes, it's there, but yes, it works. Practice, 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 practice. Um, not just practice, but practice intentionally, right? So, so there's 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 I did it. There's I did some practice. There's I practice intentionally, and the difference is you retrospect on what you did mm -hmm. and refine as you go forward. Same point, I give a talk. I give a great public presentation. I get best of show awards all the time, keynotes, blah, blah, blah. A month after I gave that talk, I go back and replay the talk. And I look at it and I look for what I can do better. Mm -hmm. So I'm not just practicing, I'm introspecting on what I did. Both my code and my talks and all kinds of other interactions. And there's that introspection that lets you refine the process so the next process, the next one that goes better and, better and better and better and better and better until you look awesome, amazing, and you're the cool expert and how did you get there? Well, here's how. It was a journey of a thousand steps, but you got to take them. Yes, I'm, I'm curious because you said, you know, you're an introvert, right? And this sounds like a very introverted process, which is kind of uh, like Arima, autoregression, right? Like you're, yeah, you're, yeah. you're, you're, you're <laughs> training yeah, yeah, on I yourself, yeah, right? right? But yeah. you cannot do this without external feedback, right? You have a feedback loop. You, yeah. Like, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, so, right. so I wonder how, and obviously a lot of people advocate extreme feedback in terms of pair programming, and obviously, like in our industry. It, it uh, helps to, to, to look at someone else's code. Your pair programming, it does a useful thing. Yeah, so yeah. how do you, at your level, you say you learn new things about coding every day. Where do yeah. they come from? Who are the people you learn from? Do you read blogs? Do you uh, uh, participate in online discussions? What's the best way for you at this point to learn? So, yeah, so, so, so I, I crossed a number of thresholds that made it more difficult to learn. So when I go to these conferences to give talks, I rarely sit in on the talks because I'm not learning anything. Mm -hmm. um, so I have an open mind and a wide reading list that's kind of hit or miss. 
stupidly four questions come around mm -hmm. and the basic questions kind of naive but underneath it there's often uh, uh, a thing going on there that I can then drag out and my so many years of coding I suddenly recognize oh he's falling over because of yada yada and maybe I didn't learn it internally but I learned it in my head mm -hmm. and the learning in my head means I can put it in my mouth and put in my words and my slides hey this is a thing that programmers do so so 10 years ago I couldn't tell you um, like I give a talk on on the different modes or paradigms programmers program in and it's new code generation it's bug fixing mm -hmm. it's tech debt elimination it's sort of an obvious way to break apart the world and those different modalities should and could and do have different ways that you act and behave and different expectations come out of them um, when was that when did i understand that it took me a long time to bring that to an understanding and then to an understanding i could verbalize and even learn to verbalize it so i'm pulling a lot of stuff out of myself now that i learned years ago um so it's prompts by questions from i'm getting prompts sources. from people right now yeah yeah and i still go find go read and look at stuff and get surprised sometimes like I'm designing a language. I went and found this web page that was how to express the following interesting programmer things in every possible language, like 30 or 40 languages. Mm -hmm. Make a new object, uh, have an if then else test, define a function, declare a type, declare a variable, declare this, assign a value, blah, 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 blah. It's fascinating to read things because you can see the history where people screwed up or tried mm -hmm. new things or whatever. And there's a lot of learning going on there, you know, figuring stuff out. Doing H2O, a lot of my learning was strictly new math. It was mm -hmm. math. And I was reading papers and I was talking to these profs and they were explaining, oh, it's easy, it's just da 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 mm -hmm. And they stepped you through it, except that you didn't learn it, but you got a feel good of how it worked on the mm -hmm. high level, and now it's time to go do it to make it stick. Yes. Learning happened there. Which is the hardest, right? Because when you listen to a famous guy like Tipsharan, you feel they understand everything. Yes. Because they're nice people. Yes. And, yes. And, but once you left, yes. it's like, now you have to call the top. Yes. How do you do that? Exactly. Right? And, no, no, I do that to other people. I stand up and say, this is how it is, it works very nicely, and I look, and did anyone else do it? No. Mm -hmm. Like, I tried to explain how to do, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Azul's World Time GC repeatedly. I stood up and said, this is exactly how we do it. I'm telling you all my secrets. Mm -hmm. It was a decade for Oracle even tried. <laughs> okay, fine. Um, same thing for all kinds of stuff, with compiler tech, whatever, fine, I get it. So, Kripshani stands up and says, this is how you do it. That, that, that. He's a very nice guy, Stephen Boyd. Very nice guy, he's explaining to it, it's so easy, you have to do it. Doing it was both tough, but then I learned. And mm -hmm. I got, I, I drilled into me some amount of new learning about statistical distributions, um, variance, and the properties with all kinds of mathematical things there. It was, it was a very, very useful thing. When I go in the FinTech world, there's a lot of new learning about, about how people, how the stock market fucking works. Yes. Pretty amazing. It's yes. a black craft because there is a date that yeah. is coming in from different strange places. Yeah, sausage making, you know, yes. it tastes delicious, but don't look at how it's made. It's pretty, <laughs> pretty nasty. So I found plenty of fraud in the stock market once you got past how you understand what it actually meant and how the market actually works. It was kind of shocking. Then I did a lot of personal uh, day trading, basically, week trading, whatever you call it for a while. Um, that actually was both full of learning for me and you know, interesting aspect, but I didn't want to have to spend my life. Although I clearly could make a living doing that. Mm -hmm. um, now I'm doing IoT sensors for distributed uh, location sensing, all kinds of sensing stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but, but fog edge, past the edge and back, you know, the, the end sensors leave the internet really, and come back and leave and come back and leave and come back. And then you want to funnel and you got to do something with it. And so there's a lot of RF radio notations going on and a lot of Bluetooth spec and a lot of, there's a lot of ML applying mm -hmm. uh, on the data that's coming in as well. Um, and so here I'm learning a new, a new domain again, um, where we're not coding per se, except that I'm learning what it takes to code in these different funny domains. But after a bit, I can route them into Java doing data science in a distributed server for the central piece. And that I just know very, you know, that's just like, da -da -da. here I know what I'm doing. Um, other parts, there's some store and forward funny network thing where you actually drop, you know, build a distributed key value store where you can drop nodes and now drop them reliably, routinely, and pick them up and drop them and pick them up and drop them and do not fail to get out of incoherent, right? It's a it's a tricky problem, and that's sort of where we're at here. Interesting. It's you know it's it's interesting. It resonates with what I've been doing for the last year. I was the uh, chief committee officer for Trusted IT Alliance, which is uh, 
uh, industrial blockchain consortium. It's, it yeah, just got yeah. merged into industrial internet consortium. So they worked with uh, uh, private blockchains for cars like BMW and Mercedes and, right. and Porsche and Jaguar. And so we ran a car from Barcelona to Berlin, uh, uh, basically charging. Uh, Paying for electricity. Yeah. Okay. So, so there yeah. are very legitimate use cases. So, my goal was to find very legitimate engineering heavy, non-crypto application of blockchain as a distributed system. But I also saw the whole edge. So, this is very interesting to me. So, I talked to Brian Cantrell a few weeks ago, and uh, and we talked about the edge. And he basically said like the edge is empty, not because for lack of trying, but because it's so hard. So, right, we don't see. Uh, you know, leaders leader, emerging on the edge. So my kind of metaphor is just like they all fell on the edge, right? Like they tried. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> they, they got the close. There's so, interestingly different problems there. I wonder what's your take on this, right? So this is—is is this basically a distributed system? And some people say forget con eventual consistency. It's, forget it. People are not eventually consistent. It's never going to happen. Just let go, uh, right? Instead of sitting atomic clocks on top of towers and making it all sync. I'm in a different zone, but this is Cliff saying you, you, you can't do this, but I, Cliff's like, oh, of course you can. So I know how to do it. <laughs> so um, I, think, I think I'm really damn close to exact consistency for things that are at the edge um, when, they're, when they're connected. Mm -hmm. And when they're disconnected, they're clearly uh, they're clearly getting scalar by the moment. It might be days, a weeks. Um, yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, right. When they reconnect, there's a period where they're still admitting that they're disconnected because they haven't yet been brought up to spec. And then they come up to speed, and now I can be exact as the time flight distance to them and back. And I can give you a trade-off that says, you can choose the amount of lazy you want to be uh, uh, versus exact with a dial a number, except that if you choose to be exact, the latency will instead give you a point where you don't know. Mm -hmm. So lazy exact will be, you are currently exact um, or you're currently, you don't know, because um, I'm trying to achieve exactness. Mm -hmm. And when I achieve exactness, I'll let you know. And that time span will be the distance and time from the edge to the center and back. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so I can give you an exact, and I can give you a lazy, and I can give you a dial a knob, um, and that's probably the limits of the laws of physics. But I can totally get you exact, fairly reasonably, when the device is brought into some reasonably closer connectivity status. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, maybe that's good enough. So I'm curious, how how do you see this evolving? So do we really change the nature of computing so you know currently the model is a data center right and so uh again brian Cantrell just launched a company called excite computer where they build data centers for everybody in a general purpose way not custom as google but obviously i think it's, it's a great idea right because you should push all the open source finding all the open compute open firmware and engineer hardware and software so i think it's what you guys done at azul so i'm actually very curious about that as well right so so there is a question of scale which kind of meshes together software and hardware but at the age it's all dispersed and and i, I wonder what, what's your take on this right so you have a data center which you optimize by essentially Fusing software and hardware, and like now everything becomes software. You spec Risk Five in in, in in open source architecture, right? So like software is basically taking over hardware. That's what's happening in the data center. Okay. But you clearly have hardware. And yes. You have, to have a base layer. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. So so how how do you see this evolving? Data center versus the edge. Uh, I mean, is the edge just like data centers is going nowhere? Like we like I mean, no. There's, there's clearly it's not going anywhere. That's correct. Yeah. It's cost effective to have centralized heavy duty computing with high power consumption, high cooling costs. And there's just like a bunch of iPhones. I mean, you can have like a massive uh, iPhone like devices. Okay, when I'm talking to edge. I'm talking about thingies that are that are meant to be disconnected routinely. Mm -hmm. So they are battery powered, um, very low power consumption, um, very limited radio distance band. Uh, things and, and limited limited bandwidth when they're connected unless they can touch something. Are they beacons or is there any computing happening there? Are they just there's, sensors? There's computing there. Um, so you can push a model down, a simple model down into them and mm -hmm. they can they can raise a flag. Mm -hmm. So I can totally take the beacons out into the field as they come and go and come and go, learn from them, mm -hmm. build a model, 
distribute the model back out to the beacon, and the beacon can raise a flag if you pass, if you exceed thresholds. Interesting. But he's still disconnected. So at the point that he raises a flag, probably the primary response you want to do is get connected mm -hmm. and do something more intelligent now. But the flag is there to say it's time to do something. Okay. And the first do is get connected, and then the next do maybe replace the failing bearing on your, you know, your your gas turbine and for the city and the town in some backwoods India mm -hmm. is failing. And in a month from now, you're going to be out of power, and GE needs to send an engineer over with a new bearing. Mm -hmm. And right, the, the same theme runs all over the place for these kinds of devices. So you teach them basics they need, and then you update their limited understanding. Yeah, they have a limited understanding based on their local sensors. So you know, shock and motion, temperature, humidity, these things integrated over time mm -hmm. because they have you know a megabyte or a couple megs mm -hmm. so they can hold history in their head so they can integrate over time <coughs> um, and and they hold the history so that when we get connected they'll tell you history as well do you see them becoming iPhones because some school of age right everybody means different things say like this is all iPhones everything is gonna have five gigs yeah, no, no, of RAM this is an easy answer so, so these things keep uh, keep shrinking and moving further out. There's, there's a hill, and the, you know, the, 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 we're pouring technology at the top, and it mm -hmm. goes out. Okay, here there's data centers and high power consumption. Here's iPhones or phones, and they're they're shredded and they mostly connected and occasionally disconnected kind of things. And they have a bunch of technologies around them. And then there's edgy things like I'm carrying in my backpack, which are you know this big and intended to be off the edge and on and off and on. And you might imagine things that are even further disconnected, like a, a, a uh, NFC tag, which is a tamper resistant tag, that's just not going to ever be connected except when you go through a point of sale and they're going to look for the rip in the tag that says it was a tampered with, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, run the same technology curve 10 years out. The data center is even spikier and more consumption for more compute per watt for blah, blah, blah. Our cell phones become ever more intelligent. Maybe they shrink and we only wear them in the ear, whatever, I don't care. Things that have cell phone power go to my, my thing and now it has cell phone strength. Maybe I can fucking finally put a cell tower connectivity in this thing. It has no cell <laughs> power connectivity. It can't. Right, right. Way too much consumption. Maybe maybe a decade from now I can't. I don't know. Right? If but then there'll be a thing density, high that's density. the size of my my you know my fingernail, my pinky or half again, that I'm dusting around in places that is disconnected and reconnected, disconnected again, right? So I think the 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 push will keep happening and the curve will keep moving out. We keep pouring tech onto the mountain at the top, and the, 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 like pouring a pile of molasses, it's oozing out into the field wider and wider. Mm -hmm. We'll see, we'll see. Exactly. So uh, I think we're coming kind of to the, uh, the end of the uh, segment. I want to kind of go back, yep. right, for yep. the, uh, and so go back, like if you can, to this 15-year-old boy who yeah. decided yeah. To, to write Pascal Compiler, yeah. which is very interesting to me, right? Because I actually, one of my, my first language was also Fortran, because I grew up in the USSR, which was behind the US, and we had Fortran 4, but we yeah. also have some strange Soviet version yeah. of Fortran called Fortran GDR, or DDR, yeah. developed in by okay. German side, which is like Fortran 77, 66 plus, and then Fortran 77, so which was exciting <laughs> to me. And then I got my first, you know, uh, Turbo Pascal, um, MSX. Turbo Pascal uh, was a game changer. MSX sex computer, but yeah. it did not occur to me to do a Pascal compiler. I was interested in, they had this overloading, they had this modules which we can write to disk, and the disk yeah. was the 800 megabytes uh, floppies, and so I could actually connect yeah. two of the, so I was kind of more interested in storage, and how, right, but I'm curious, so it's like, I, uh, I wrote on a Radio Shack Trash 80 with a cassette tape. Cassette tape, that's right. So yeah. this is yeah, like, it, was, it was level two basic on a 4K machine, there was the first pass, which read Pascal and wrote out P code, and put the P code in RAM, and then I swapped the basic program out and left the P code in RAM. And the second basic program I loaded in took P code and emitted machine code, which I think I didn't either spit to disk as a file or a disk, a cassette tape, yes. or, or execute in place, right? And my only real program, I wrote, I wrote a bunch of little toy ones, was a breakout game that had sound and paddle motion, and it had the classic breakout thing on a Radio Shack Trash 80 graphics, written in Pascal. Interesting. So, so I'm curious, right? So let's say, like, uh, uh, we want to help folks scale themselves and their companies. So, uh, I, like, as a physicist, I'm interested in starting condition, right? So yeah, yeah. here's this 15-year-old boy, and you decide to write yeah. a compiler, and you basically stick with it through your whole life, yeah. right? And, yeah. and, and you're, like, you accumulate different skills, but you, you're fortunate, you recognized 
you have this passion, yeah. right? And yeah. you scale, you basically scale it for yeah. the whole life, yeah. right? Yeah. So, yeah. so how do we kind of enable more people? Like, let's say I'm an engineer and there's so much stuff going on, right? So I'm kind of gravitating towards hacking some stuff, and my bosses tell me to do some other things. Right. But right. I, I, I am kind of, you know, like yeah. I want yeah, to yeah, do yeah. my yeah. my yeah. thing. So I'm, I'm curious, like you were fortunate, but you also worked hard yeah. to get right. yourself yeah. to the places, yeah. right. companies, right. projects right. where your your core skills. Right. And actually, there were times when I didn't have that that lineup, that I had the paying job that didn't align with what I wanted to go do. So this is the, this is the whole. It's your passion. It's no compromises. Mm -hmm. So you have to figure out how to make it work. But you can't lose your passion, or you, you you just as a person you'll hate yourself. So you just have to keep following your passion here. So how do you make that work? Yeah. There are a couple ways, and and where you end up going depends on your life situation and all that kind of stuff. Um, <coughs> one is to say, I have my after work hours, and this is what I'm doing when I'm off the job, mm -hmm. and I very clearly make a distinction. This is off company time. Boss does not own this piece of work. It's mm -hmm. my tech. Yep. And I am doing it um, for me. Yep. Right. And and, and instead of uh, uh, going to see a movie or going out drinking party on Saturday night, I am doing my, my passion. Right. Mm -hmm. And any artist worth their salt will totally agree. And this is what they're doing for you. Which is the opposite of what the Silicon Valley ethics is. If you do it on in our employment on our own machine, so I think normally now you have to actually change the country because they don't say on your time. They they say if you do on company property, like it's a fuzzy area now. They want to own everything. Oh yeah, right. right. So, so so the first thing you do is um, you understand that most employment contracts that you sign are completely illegal in a variety of fronts. Mm -hmm. um, there are some company secrets that you're not allowed to walk off with, including customer contacts and the like. Fine. But anything that says that you're my personal slave and I own everything you do is like bullshit. Yeah. Right, okay, fine. So um, don't sign those. Yeah. And up front say, I I'm not going to sign this, but mm -hmm. I can sign a nearby contract. I'm just going to redline a few things and mm -hmm. you pass it by and it's okay. And if you're, you know, if you can't make that happen because you're too desperate for this job, like if the company won't do it, and you're not just literally starving, don't sign it. This is yeah. not a good place to go work. Yeah. Okay. If the company, most of them will just do it. Um, you know, if you're a junior guy and you need that first job, you might have to figure out how to make sure that the thing you're doing for your passion is kept remotely. Mm -hmm. um, it's not too hard to make it clearly. I only logged in on my own machine, my mm -hmm. own time. I only logged in to. Don't do it at work. Don't yeah, do it. Don't do it at work. On the don't do it at work. Work cloud. Don't we'll do, do it. Don't read touch, some Amazon. Don't yeah. Don't touch any of that stuff. Personal machine. My own personal Wi-Fi connects to you know. I do my own laptop. I push to GitHub. With my own personal GitHub account. Mm -hmm. Right. Don't touch anything on anywhere in the company. Nothing. And that'll that's clean. Yeah. I wonder what's your take on this because normally when you sign IP contracts, there is a list of secrets which you already know you should put in. And the, basic, I, I the assumption is yeah, like an yeah, opt in. Yeah, right, Everything right. you put there is yours, yeah. but if you forgot something, that's, right. yeah, that's right, new. Right. Right? Right. How do you deal with this? Um, I put the big ones down right away and I mentioned that there's lots of things that I know of already mm -hmm. that, um, that I still didn't mention everything. And also, those contracts also say stuff like, if you learned this from some other place, uh, then it's the burden of the company to to show that you stole. Them. Yes. Okay. So if it comes down to a legal agreement, like, like the worst thing happens here is that you piss off somebody who's not very bright about what these contracts mean mm -hmm. and tries to threaten you. You can take these things and more or less throw them, and you know, the, you get a warning from some lawyer, you throw them in the trash and ignore it. Mm -hmm. If it really comes down to a legitimate fight. Um, besides getting obviously real legal advice, 99% um, of things they say is company secrets you stole, you can show were well known publicly beforehand, and you just hit Google once and you got it. You <laughs> turn around and say, "Here, dude, I got this from this place, right?" And, you know, take your and shove it, right? Yep. Um, if you walk off with company code uh, and somebody pattern matches their code to your code. You're an idiot. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And a dishonest one at that. <laughs> yeah. But if you write an interesting algorithm um, and you go and rewrite it somewhere else, there's going to be similarities. Mm -hmm. um, but that's still It's not legit. patentable. Like, the algorithms are not patentable. It's, it's as, still, as it's as a, that's now. correct. It's still legit use. Yeah, mm -hmm. yep. Right. Interesting. So, and finally, I think my last question will be very simple. So, scale is a phenomena, basically, which is 
the holy grail around here. Like everybody, <laughs> yeah. you, know, you want that, that thing which makes you Google, which makes you Cliff, right? Like which makes you a scalable I'd person. Really be something, Cliff. So, something, right? <laughs> yeah, something. So, so, so you know, you want to be Spark. You want to take over, yep. you know, minds of thousands of programmers so they contribute. And yeah, yeah. So when you know, when we see these things, we know Rust, a lot of passion, I, a great I'm community. Very fond of what Rust is trying to accomplish. I, right. I, I hope them the best, and I'm looking hard at what they're doing. You know, <laughs> so so we, we know these projects, and so like TensorFlow is an example, right? Like yeah, some yeah. somehow it won. There was a bunch of other stuff. Yep. And Spark, there was something called Scooby. We yep. don't remember that, yeah, but the, yeah, was there yeah, actually yeah. a question? Which of these big data frameworks are going to win? So, do you think it's nature or nurture? Is this, <laughs> you know, are you lucky? I mean, were you born with this? Is Google just a bunch of like super scalable people? Or is this something which can be, can be taught, so, can so be can man learn? raising four kids, and I raised four <laughs> as well, there was very clearly some, some uh, nature, and, you know, there was some nurture too. So, mm -hmm. So there's some luck in life as well. Um, I, you know, I think uh, uh, Spark had the right idea at the right time. Yes. And they had a champion. He was pushing through a better way to talk about data flows. I'm not talking data science, just flows of flows, data. Yes. Um, and, and that just resonated with people. That was like a really cool concept. And that lets you sort of work with data flows, which immediately lends itself to data science. Um, in, in a ways that were just not possible before. Um, I think that was, a, you know, that was, uh, uh, Matthias just did, a, did a, a cool thing. Google came up with internet search at the time the internet was, was busting, and that was just this ultimately powerful thing. Mm -hmm. They have built an amazing company, and they have built some really cool tech afterwards, yep. but their keystone, their cornerstone is still the search. Yes, right? and, and the implementation of it, because and, they built it. And, and the implementation. Well. Part of the implementation strength is that the, the hardware engineering guys go, go crazy, do their thing, and the engineering guys had the passion of scale, mm -hmm. right? Um, and they, so they nailed it. Yes. Um, and now they're looking for, I have scale, everything's a, you know, I have a hammer, everything's a nail, right? They're looking for everything they can nail with scale. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they're finding things. So, so there's, a, there's a cool thing there, although I'm still thinking they haven't found the next thing to replace internet search from their business point of view. They have definitely built really awesome tools that they're doing really cool things with. You know, you know now I can find all the cats on the internet. Yes. <laughs> Separate yeah. from the dogs. <laughs> Yes. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, and kind of just to uh, expand a bit. Uh, so, you're basically kind of the super CTO. And what advice? I think as engineers, we kind of understand what engineers need. If you are advising <laughs> a CEO, what would you tell them if they want to grow the culture of scale? If they want to have the company which is scale through technology, what should they care about? It's, it's a different thing, and this is a position I haven't been in. So the first thing you have to do is they have to get the business right. Mm -hmm. So mostly I've been in small companies where the CEO has had trouble getting the business model right. Mm -hmm. And you know, at H2O, I'll claim that I, I saw the problem, but I didn't have an answer for my CEO. Mm -hmm. um, and that was part of the reason that we weren't necessarily the right fit at some point. Mm -hmm. um, at Norinsic, I'll claim we had the right market fit, but it was a distributed team and I couldn't rein in a crazy CEO mm -hmm. who was doing the wrong thing. I have not been in a company where the technology and the market fit had hap has happened and we're now growing gangbusters and what do we do? Mm -hmm. right? Well, Sun and Java, <laughs> The, the, I was not a CTO in that. Right, position. right. I was not in that position. Well, that's there. right. That's right. But yeah. you, what, like, if you go back, right, like you know what the great oh, yeah, team right. is like, right? Yeah, right. Like, what's the example from this interaction? What's the optimal kind of interaction of business and technology where you grow through technology? So, so it's still a case where you have to keep the engineers happy and rolling forward, and enthused and passionate. Some of that is you explain to the engineer, and you can totally explain engineers what they do and how it impacts business. Mm -hmm. Because this then in turn empowers them to make decisions on different tech they're going to chase to better fit the business you're looking at. Mm -hmm. Right, because as a business guy, you might see the opportunity if only we could solve this problem, but not understand that it could be solved or that there is a better way to solve it. <clears throat> and the engineer guy just doesn't see the business side piece of it. There is some cross communication that I routinely see not happening, that I try to make happen at every company I run, um, so that the the engineers get both the risks they're taking at being at a startup and 
the right thing to go solve for when you're trying to make the technology work. Um, I'm still looking for the right fit for them both while I'm in the CTO role. Mm -hmm. I've had two bad CEOs and a bad business model um, not work out. I guess two bad business models with okay people and two bad CEOs. Uh, and a couple personal things I did where I completely broke even and didn't want to do that for a living, but it was working, but I didn't want to do that for a living. Um, we'll see how this next one goes. So how much do you think the CEO should learn about the technology? For if, you know, for instance, oh, if something to make strength of this. No, yeah. no, at a startup, the CEO should be strong in it. Mm -hmm. he, he needs to understand the limitations and strengths because he's going to be selling this tech. Mm -hmm. He has to come across as a, a, a sensible, reasonable about it mm -hmm. to whoever he goes to. Sales guys, you can start with guys who don't know the difference between a compiler and an anti-gravity belt, and they'll, they'll sell every possible thing that you can't make. But as soon as you know they get the words right and the jargon dialed in, they'll be close enough mm -hmm. to get the next conversation. And the next conversation is, you drag in somebody who's technically expert yep. to really make sure that we know, and they want to know that, that somebody believes, right? Yes. So the, 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 here the sales guy is typically really looking to bring a connection in. You'd like to have a guy who's also an expert and could sell, that's a very rare uh, skill set. But you can get them that are, that are good enough experts, same as a CEO needs to be good enough expert, that they don't make a fool of themselves. A CEO needs to be better, because he needs to really know that this, that this product will change the world. Yes. He has to believe it will change the world. Yes. Right? Um, the sales guy only has to believe it will change this company he's talking to. <laughs> right, right, right. So it's good It's good to kind of to understand the technology, how you can scale through it if you want to build a scalable company. If, you, if you're a CEO, yeah, you should see yeah. that. Because Mo you want to grow. Most technologies, like the VC still want, you know, eh, hey, next Google, great, I get it. Most of these technologies I see these companies, these startups going after, are clearly not going to change the world. They have an obvious cap. Mm -hmm. So you can pivot. The harder thing is usually building the underlying base tech, which has lots of applications over what the company tagline says, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And when and where do you pivot? And you might be planning on pivoting all along, and the tagline's just a red flag, maybe. But I see a lot of these companies maybe build some cool tech, get it, things rolling, they, they've learned a lot, they need to pivot. Um, and knowing when and how to pivot is a key one. H2O, we pivoted, um, you know, after, I'm gonna say, almost a year, nine months, to, to machine learning. Yes. Um, from a distributed key value store, a better key value store. Yeah, which was a great, great pivot. Oh yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, right. Um, but totally, that was like a, you know, an eye opener for me. It was like, gosh, we can do this, and it makes sense, and has to happen. Next time around, next time, next time, every company went afterwards, keep looking, and then the, you build some cool tech. But the tagline of the company may not be it, so you need to pivot. And that's the advice I give the CEOs. When is it time to pivot? Because the business isn't there for the tech, but the tech's hard to replicate, hard mm -hmm. to get. Can we take it to somewhere else where we can grow better with it? Mm -hmm. right? So that brings us back to scale, and I think it's a good wrap. Okay. So thank you so much. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Yeah, it was fun. And we'll see how you scale in the next iteration. Yeah. We're in the heart of Silicon Valley, which proves and scales all the time. <laughs> okay. Thank you.